All right, this work? Cool. So Luis, uh, I work at Reddit, uh, and we do know our page views, I just can't share them all. But uh, sorry in advance if I cough, I'm working through a cold from the weekend, uh, but started in data. My first gig out of college was uh, sh building Excel services, so Google Sheets before Google Sheets was out. Um, and these Google guys love it. Uh, and then uh, worked at, built out the Office telemetry team, so data pipelines of Office, so every time you saw a crash or all the quality, uh, quality data out of Office, uh, the team built out the pipelines to get all that back to us, which had about a billion users is a pretty high scale, especially when you're deciding what cabs to get from people, which is a pretty decent, big, pretty big data at that sense. Um, did a little startup down in LA for a while, and then uh, was going to do something in the AI data space uh, as, a, as, a, as a new startup, and then uh, ended up getting connected with one of the partners in Andreessen, introduced me to Reddit, uh, and was like, well, if you want to build an AI data startup, you could go and grind for three years and uh, try to get enough data to make it a data problem, or you could just take Reddit's, which at the time I think had three data engineers, no search team, uh, a handful of people in the relevance team. Uh, so I took the challenge. Um, I, I like the hats, not enough to wear them, because my team is actually called the Reddit Intelligence Group, which is an acronym for RIG. Uh, yeah. My title on Slack is the RIG Tool Pusher, which is the, essentially the director of a oil rig. Um, so very much ascribed to that uh, uh, analogy there. Um, and that's me. Oh, and I guess Google. Uh, so we're trying out Google in a number of things, largely around analytics. We use uh, mostly BigQuery. Uh, which at Reddit scale is actually a lot. Um, so we're taking out kind of small chunks of the stack, but uh, huge amounts of data uh, pushing into it. All right, Robin Lee. Uh, I work for TypeJoy, which is an advertising monetization platform. Uh, in terms of the data scale we're dealing with is around 200 terabytes to 300 terabytes active data. And the data data addition is about 20 terabytes compressed. So uh, my data journey started with from a investment bank uh, back in 2016. Uh, I worked there for about six years. I did everything you can imagine within the investment bank, starting from building up trading tools, you know, building risk modules, and then end up with uh, sitting on trading desks for two years on New in their New York office. Then I get a little bit bored because of the uh, economics crash in 2008. Uh, we literally don't have any uh, commissions or bonus for two years. So I decided to move on. And I'm a computer major, so I feel like my passion is still within uh, the technology world. So I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. And I started to lead a team of uh, data engineers as well as data science engineers. So what we do right now is um, uh, we are not just moving data around, we're also responsible for the entire data stack, data platform, starting from uh, the data infrastructure, building up the servers, moving data around, do the data, do, do the data warehousing, using the data, making sense of the data, as well as training modules and serve our product decision based on top of it, right? So uh, that's pretty much about me. Oh, uh, Google stack. So we're starting to use Google um, from 2015. Uh, uh, part of the reason is we were running a very beefy Vertica cluster. I'm not sure if you guys heard of Vertica. Uh, that was a, uh, a commercial licensed enterprise scale uh, MPP system, I would call it. And uh, our cost was around a million dollars to a few million dollars a year by the perpetual license uh, hardware cost as well as the support cost. So we were thinking to move on to some cheaper solutions. We were looking at, let's say, uh, AWS Redshift, uh, Snowflake, uh, as well as Google BigQuery. I'm not sure if you remember, but two of us actually interact a lot on Stack Overflow regarding the early questions we have uh, on Google BigQuery. Uh, so that's, that's actually how to get us started with uh, BigQuery back in 2015. And then uh, in 2017, just this year, we move our entire uh, Hadoop and Spark stack from our uh, on-premises data center into Google Cloud. We just live it in October, so it's pretty impressive. All right, that's me. Thank you. Hi, Andreas again. Um, so what first got me interested in data, I think, was at my previous company, we had a lot of rich access to user data. And it felt like we were really heavily underutilizing that. And it just kind of was 
an itch that when you have all this data, you should be able to get a lot of valuable insight out of it. And then so coming to Thumbtack, where we did have a data platform team, started to really appreciate when you have the proper tooling and infrastructure to really make use of your data, you can use that to drive really informed decisions and gain some insights about how your product is being used in ways that you couldn't have otherwise. Um, as far as using GCP, uh, we use it pretty heavily now. Our data platform is almost entirely on Google Cloud. We heavily use Dataproc and BigQuery. Uh, we also use um, PubSub, that's driving that map right there, along with Spark Streaming on, data, on Dataproc. Yeah. Cool. Um, so talking about uh, your data platform, um, can, we, can you do a parallel between like before and after, and, and what do you think that changed for the better as you evolved your platform over time? Uh, before and after, before GCP? Before and after GCP, or like earlier stages of GCP as you ramped up in using different services? So before GCP, we had a Hadoop cluster that we were managing ourselves in AWS, and that worked very well for a year and a half, two years. We started hitting some real growing pains when it came to scale, and a lot of the static provisioning of every time we needed more capacity, we'd have to manually provision a new cluster, bring it up, do a HDFS rebalance, wait a couple days, then it could be start being utilized. Uh, we had very spiky utilization of our resources, so all the ad hoc analysis, all ad hoc queries that were being run were being um, run on Hive and Impala. Those would be conflicting because it was sharing resources with Yarn and the Spark jobs we were running. So just this really inflexible infrastructure made it so that we wanted something that could grow more dynamically as our data would grow. And GCP had some very nice offerings in terms of having data prop clusters that can be ephemeral and be spun up in 90 seconds, run your job, and spin back down. BigQuery, where we can just kind of pass the buck on to Google and let them deal with all the operations overhead, because being on call at this time was a huge pain. It would be basically most of your week on call would be just spent putting out fires. So it was a huge win for us. Cool. How about FJ? How uh, what's your like the? Uh, yeah, one? I think I think uh, some of the uh, a lot of people bring up a very good point, which is you know data engineering is not only about moving data around; it's also about what tools to choose and what to what tools to utilize, right? And I think up to that point, um, we previously had a very large uh, on-premises data center. Uh, we built ourselves. We basically bought up a couple million dollars worth of hardware, strapped them together, uh, outsourced a uh, company to do online smart, uh, offline smart hand works, and threw it into uh, US East data center right next to AWS, internally through with a Direct Connect fiber link. All of the work is pretty cool, but it has a lot of operational overheads, right? And uh, we have our 300 to 400 machine Hadoop production cluster, typically sit on uh, bare metal hardware, if any nose goes offline, we have to deal with them, right? So, uh, and then after we started looking at BigQuery, after we move our entire MPP solution into BigQuery, we realized that a, a, a company size of TypeDray, which is around 200 to 300 people, it, it's pretty impressive to do on pri on premises data centers, one thing, but on the other thing is we need to think about optional overhead as well as you know the actual true running cost for your infrastructure. So that's why we're looking, starting to looking at moving our entire infrastructure to uh, cloud-based, and uh, we did a lot of benchmarking and comparison. My Google account reps helped me a lot with that, and. Uh, but at the end of the day, it works really well. So we merge our uh, entire Hadoop uh, infrastructure from on premises data center into Google Cloud, uh, but a little bit different from uh, uh, this gentleman's usage. We didn't use Dataproc. We basically built our own uh, Elastic uh, Hadoop and Spark cluster and to run on Google Cloud utilizing the uh, cloud power for very spiky workload. Um, that's before and after. So uh, we were on uh, Hive before. Uh, I've always been a fan of not building my own uh, infra when I don't need to. Like, data infrastructure is not going to be the differentiator for Reddit. It's going to be what makes it succeed or not. Uh, so we were using Kubel, which is kind of cool, but the difference between Kubel and uh, BigQuery is essentially like 
picture driving a manual car in the 60s when you had to do a lot of work and maintenance and uh, checking the engine on oil and doing all that stuff versus like an automatic car this day and age where you don't have to take it in for a checkup until like 15,000 miles. Um, so it's even less uh, overhead on the engineering side. Uh, and it helped with some of the, the speed concerns that we had. That said, you have to actually structure your data uh, cognizantly of some of, especially when you have the amount of data that Reddit has, uh, of some of the limitations, because even BigQuery has limits. Um, everyone has limits, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so there is some thinking that you have to do around that, uh, and there are some differences with uh, the abilities that you have in Hive versus what you have in BigQuery to, to acknowledge, but uh, it's certainly a lot less uh, maintenance overhead than we had even in Kubel, which is a lot of, like, Theoretically, is much easier than running your own, uh, or, which is much easier than running your own Hive clusters. Um, but was still uh, basically the the speed of iteration was the main uh, reason to try it out. Like being able to write a query, run it, and get it back really quickly, uh, versus waiting two minutes for Kubel Hive clusters to spin up, uh, or having Presto clusters that were big enough and that your SQL query was like optimized enough to actually be able to run against Presto. Uh, BigQuery just got some of those concerns away from us, and there were more tools that. Uh, out of the box were built to support it. So things like mold analytics, uh, Looker, uh, Periscope data, which you can just point to you know, BigQuery in the cloud versus having to figure out how you get your you know, clusters that Kubel spin up somewhere to feed up to some of these data analytics tools. So, Awesome. Um, Why do you use BigQuery? <laughs> <laughs> I tried it. <laughs> um, I mean, in, in, for Felipe, I mean, if you can give an example where you've seen like a very interesting transformation for a customer going from something more cumbersome maybe to a much more streamlined solution. So let me bring the before and after to the um, every person is a data scientist, especially people here, um, how these tools enable laziness. Like w if I have a question, if I want to find out something about uh, Reddit or Stack Overflow or Hacker News or any other site that looks interesting. If I have to start by scraping, uh, I just need to have a lot of energy to finish that project first. That's before. Now I just need to know that I'm avail that that data is available somewhere. Uh, it's ready on BigQuery. I can just connect and start asking questions right away. And I think that's uh, how Reddit got awareness that BigQuery existed. Basically, there's um, this guy, Jason Bob Garner in Washington that started scraping every Reddit comment. Suddenly, he started sharing that data. That data ended up in BigQuery. And then one day, this Reddit itself sees that that data is there and starts writing some queries without any other effort other than the data is ready there for you. And well, it's useful, it's insightful. It's, I didn't have to analyze anything, I didn't have to prepare anything to, to be able to analyze it. Cool. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about workloads, the type of workloads that this technology powers. I was curious to, to get some examples on where does the end value come from and kind of like in terms of the data that flows through the system. What's that data? What does it represent for you? Um, and for, for Felipe, it's more around like interesting examples. Like you, you showed an examples with taxis. What else have you seen that's more like transformative in nature? Um, let me give the microphone to the actual users first. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now we're using it primarily for analytics, so uh, how many page views we get, uh, who's looking at what, uh, what, um, like what kind of aggregate information we have, how feature users are, are running. Uh, I'm actually working on getting availability numbers into there, so getting HA proxy logs parsed and into BigQuery so we can see by service what the availability is. Uh, a lot of business metrics, OKRs that we track, time on site, uh, you know, DAUs, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, some of the more, and then there's some interesting like uh, investigations. If you look at things like uh, anti-evil afters around like spam avoidance, botnet detection, vote manipulation, um, there's a lot of information there that uh, we may not. The, the, the difference in that kind of uh, workflow is that it's very ad hoc, so you don't really have like. If you had a way that you could automatically detect bots or vote manipulation that was 100% accurate, you would just productize it and then block them, which we do, but it's an arms race, so then they change things. So you did a much more ad hoc flow where 
we start seeing some weird behavior on the site and you just have to dig into the data and pivot in a number of ways and try to figure out, okay, what are the common themes? What are the common threads? Like, is it actually a botnet? Is it a sleeper cell? Like, are there different things that people are doing here? Um, and that really helps in kind of that ad hoc, uh, one of the milk type queries. So uh, it's been super helpful there where, you know, <clears throat> if each one of the iterations on Hive would take a couple of minutes where, you know, if you're doing it just a, on a small time range, it takes a couple seconds to get an answer for uh, looking at enough data where you need, like, things where you need aggregates, right? Like, to know if I have a vote manipulation or botnet, I can't look at, like, 100 votes. I have to look at millions of votes and start seeing, like, what the patterns are. Uh, so that's been super helpful there. Uh, so essentially, right now, like, business metrics, KPIs, uh, understanding how people are using the site, how the site's behaving, uh, and then as well as uh, ad hoc investigations on uh, you know different things around the the anti evil space. There's a couple of interesting things we built. Um, I have one query that actually gives me a listing, like a same same thing as you see when you go to the front page of Reddit. Uh, so it's sourced by your hot algorithm now or some models that we're starting to uh, experiment with. But with any uh, analytics event that I have, I have a query that I can just point to that event and cre generate a front page based on that query. So I could see like what would the front page of Reddit look like if all we used was shares uh, to rank content or views from different countries or you know. Uh, size of the uh, number of comments, those kind of things, so. Cool. Uh, for us, pretty much the same, right? You, you know, uh, we mentioned uh, we use it for an, uh, ad hoc analysis, a lot of ad hoc queries, as well as uh, supporting, uh, uh, reporting that uh, drive insights. Uh, we also use BigQuery for uh, uh, lightweight ETLs, such as we do a lot of moduling uh, in, um, in our Spark and Hadoop cluster, but we use BigQuery to extract a lot of features, do a lot of the data cleanups, and eventually feed into the Hadoop and the Spark cluster for uh, module trainings. Uh, uh, I think there is one more uh, thing which is pretty interesting in BigQuery is, is uh, it leaves very well with the other Google products, such as the uh, stack drivers, which produce the loggings, as well as uh, all, all the APIs uh, that Google supports. Uh, one of the good, uh, very interesting example, which is, you know, good, good BigQuery is pricing at per query level, at how much data you moved per query. So it's eliminated a lot of uh, DBME work and uh, infrastructure operational work, but uh, a new type of work which is introduced by BigQuery, slightly, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it is how do you curb your cost, right? So how do you keep your cost at minimum level, making sure your users are running um, meaningful queries to get their results. So we uh, calling all the Google APIs to get all the queries usage per user per query level, normalize them, you know, stripe out the dates part, uh, the common filter parts and putting them into good BigQuery table for analyzing BigQuery costs, which is actually, actually um, yeah, it's kind of like a feedback loop, stuff like that. We so spent it's pretty 10, interesting. bucks on one dashboard by mistake. <laughs> yeah, there are, yeah, if you don't, if you're not be careful, your cost for one particular BigQuery could go out pretty fast. Please turn on your cost controls. <laughs> they are there. But it's also like it's well, the one thing I want to add here is um, being in a place where you have this knob is fairly empowering, right? Being able to decide that I want to spend more when I need to spend more. Yeah, BigQuery definitely, sorry, BigQuery definitely produce all the knobs and controls for curbing, uh, for cost controls and access controls. I'm just giving an example here. <clears throat> yeah. And we definitely saw some unexpectedly high BigQuery costs at first and realized it was because we're putting these powerful tools in people's hands and they want to use them and do new things with them. So also educating users, like maybe you don't need to do select stars or maybe you should use this partition time column and that helps a lot. Um, so yeah, I think we largely use BigQuery in similar ways. Uh, it's really enabled some <coughs> new avenues to do really fast analytics and on large data sets that we didn't have the capability of before. Um, I'd say one of our biggest one of the things that I enjoy the most about GCP is using Dataproc because we use it so heavily. Um, having any developer able to spin up an arbitrarily sized cluster to test their job, to not have to wait for this big Spark batch job to run has been really powerful and really enabled faster iteration. So as a developer, that's become a huge boon for us. Awesome. Um, 
to give my innovative uses. Uh, what it really made me, made me, I'm pretty proud of being part of Google Cloud is as you listen all of these examples and how they are solving problems at their huge scale, that everyone here has access to the same tools. Uh, you can basically run the same processes, you can prepare yourself, uh, work at the same scale. Uh, <coughs> limiting cost is an issue, but it's not a hard issue to solve. You just put the cost controls there. But just having access to the same size of data, same tools, um, can really, one, serve you for fun, but then if you want to work at any of these places or many more, you're ready. You have everything, you've tried everything, and you are speaking the same language uh, from day zero. And I, I'll add to I mean, cost is only an issue because we, like, that's the, the $10,000 dashboard was a mold analytics dashboard which was set to refresh every five minutes that was scanning every single screen view of Reddit. Like, that's just dumb. <laughs> like, so it's not really, and it's, it's the amount of data is ridiculous. Like, most, if you're playing with it, like, you might spend a few bucks if you're using it on your own projects or on most things. Is there, this is talking when you're, when you're talking, when you're talking about like the top four company or top four website in the US, then you're going to have those kind of things. But at that level, 10,000 bucks is actually not a lot of money. So. Okay, cool. So we talked a lot about like past, present. Um, let's talk about the future. So assuming you have this like magic wand, what are the areas in which you are investing moving forward and what do you think is going to make like material difference from you, for you? Yeah, so I'm excited about the ML stuff uh, on Google Cloud. So there's a, when you talk about uh, same people having the same tools and being able to work across companies, that's actually one of the pieces that uh, was kind of surprising and as a positive was uh, a lot of the ML community uh, is actually using uh, Google Cloud on their own projects because it's a little bit more developer friendly. It's a little bit easier than uh, AWS. AWS is probably the least developer friendly uh, thing out there. Um, so that was really helpful because we can go and recruit and the folks that were recruiting actually get excited that we're open to exploring that in the, in the future. So having your data, that's one step. Uh, cleaning it up is another one. Uh, and Google certainly has a leg up in a lot of the ML APIs and uh, uh, functionality that we might want to start playing with and using in the future. So that's an area I'm excited about. Uh, I think another one is just continuous improvements on, on BigQuery. There's, there's definitely still low hanging fruit, even though it's a, a big area where uh, we could significantly increase like speed of queries, uh, cost reduction, uh, ability, like, you know, even the, the JavaScript UDF stuff is uh, pretty powerful that you can do there. So. Uh, we're just, I mean, we know we're just scratching the surface. We're just, we're dumping data there and then running queries on it. Uh, there's a lot on the whole Google Cloud ecosystem that I think we'll be really interested to start playing with. Right, uh, a very similar observation on my side. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have the MPB system in BigQuery. We have our data lake on GCS and we have our entire Hadoop on GCE. So now what, right? So we have all the data. We have all the pipelines move over. The next step for us is to translate our simple machine learning modules, such as linear regressions, random forest, over to deep learning modules. So we've been starting to look at tensor solutions offered by uh, CloudML. Uh, our POC uh, deep learning module produced very impressive results. Uh, our, I think the, the biggest challenge for us is not to how to train a module on Google Cloud, it's how to serve it at real time back to our customers. That's a problem challenge for ourselves. So, uh, but having that in mind, I mean, uh, the next step for us is definitely how to, you know, uh, gradually moving from a, uh, a spark driven machine learning uh, uh, path over to deep learning uh, driving uh, path on our side. Uh, that's pretty much on my side. Awesome. Uh, I think I, I'm on the same boat as the, the two of you. Uh, one additional thing that I'm excited about is the unification of batch and streaming paradigms. I think kind of making the leap to stream, a streaming world is pretty daunting, and it takes a lot of upfront thought about how to make that switch. And with the rise of Apache Beam and Spark structured streaming, that's becoming a lot easier, and I'm excited to see that. Awesome. Um, so, um, no. yes, yeah, so to give my two bits, uh, yes, machine learning is completely the future and what everyone is really focused right now. Everyone wants to learn TensorFlow, et cetera, et cetera. So that's pretty exciting to see how things are going to get easier to use. 
But then at the same time, um, I personally have not moved into the machine learning realm. I just think there's so much more to do with data. Like anything machine learning will require data engineers. That's the name of the, the meetup. Uh, how do we move data? And I'm especially excited about real-time data. Um, so we have PathSub now available. I would really love to see more public feeds of fresh uh, live stream data and people doing things with it. Uh, building pipelines over it. But totally, Matthew learning that the hottest one. Okay, so I will I will ask like one round question to go around, but then I want you to think about your questions um, as we as we close close down this session. Uh, so my my kind of my final question um, for you is, if you were to if you were able to go back based on what you know today and tell a story to yourself, tell. Tell a bunch of advices. Like, what would that be? Think a little bit better how to spread apart your data sets. <laughs> we, uh, we put everything, uh, all of our analytics event in one data set. Uh, with BigQuery, you don't get uh, the ability to do custom partitions uh, like you do in Hive uh, or hierarchical partitions. So everything's partitioned by day. Uh, and it turns out that we just generate too much data per day uh, to even even at BigQuery scales to be able to scan through one day's worth of data in a reasonable time. Uh, so leveraging the ability, like different data sets as basically one level of partitioning your data uh, would have been a way to be much faster. Um, we kind of... Uh, we were avoiding. We, we were way too much into the denormalized camp uh, and avoiding joins from due to the slowness of our uh, Hive solutions there. Um, and I, it's I have not had any issues with joins in BigQuery, so I would be more uh, open to doing joins and separating out my data. It's a refreshing thing to hear about, like big data joins. Big data and joins used to be incompatible. <laughs> uh, I think for me, if I uh, want to redo it over, I probably want to have uh, data visualization, uh, a lot more richer data visualizations to tell my story uh, of how we're dealing with data, how we using data to drive insights and uh, uh, giving uh, driving the revenue of the company. I think that's very important because a lot of your data engineers do a lot of dirty works and grunt works, but you know, um, in order for your company to be a data-driven company, it needs, you definitely need a lot of insights and a lot of uh, visualization of your data not just the data sitting on a spreadsheet. I think along the same vein as visualization, uh, we had a bug uh, a little while back where some of our front-end servers, front servers were stopped sending event data to the back end and no one noticed for a while, uh, for an embarrassingly long time. So having realizing that not all failures are catastrophic and that they could be partial or subtle and having more rich monitoring and alerting to make sure that your data is trustworthy and safe is something that is kind of obvious in hindsight. Sweet. So any questions from, from the audience? I think we all have all. So my question was sort of on the data governance side, and you mentioned in terms of understanding which visualizations or business questions you need an answer. Uh, what are some either like process level mechanisms or actual tools? Like, do you guys have like a glossary of like certain reports that you guys certify, or like what are some of the ways you kind of manage? You know, we are getting accurate data and should be used for X, Y, and Z. So the question was on uh, data governance, uh, and I'm assuming uh, leading into like the QA side of it, things that bro break, but um, I'll add a little bit more too. There's all, all around a PII um, protection of data. You probably don't, like, while analytics is great, you probably don't want everyone in the company to have access. Like on Reddit, for example, not everyone in the company should know every single post that a particular account can see, right? Like, that's kind of creepy. Um, there is... <clears throat> 
IP information, PII information, or uh, privacy policy. I think it's like 90 days, <clears throat> excuse me, where we can keep PII on people. Uh, so things like an IP address uh, we keep for a while, but then we have to go and mask it. So what happens when the scripts to mask it or the items to mask it actually break and you're no longer masking that? So what we've done, a lot of data, data governance on Reddit at least is, <clears throat> first you gotta have a breakdown of what data you're collecting, where you're putting it, and where it lives. Um, some of the conversation we were just having is some people scrape us and put data in different places. Uh, so there's also some ideas of like, okay, at some point we need to start caring about where the data lives outside of that. So make sure at least we're, we're protecting our users, protecting uh, uh, you know, their information. Uh, but first, idea, first, first step is an audit. Like, take, take uh, an audit of where you are. Uh, there's companies actually the same way that you get third-party security audits. There's third-party data audits. So if you're at that level of of uh, of um, uh, data governance, you can get a third party to come in, look at your data, see what you're storing, where you have it, like where data leakage is. Uh, and it's actually not that hard to accidentally leak data to your, at least within your company. Like there's so many processes, there's things that go to an event collector, then a Kafka pipeline, then we dump it into um, S3 or GCS and then BigQuery and any of those, if all of a sudden other people have access to it for other purposes, now they can you know, pipe in and look at data that they shouldn't be looking at. Um, then there's the whole quality side. We've had the same bugs where Android uh, Reddit apps stopped sending uh, events. I don't think it was screen views, but one of our core events, it just stopped sending. And we didn't notice until like a couple of weeks after the build was out because Android, like the adoption uh, curve is a little bit smaller, but we didn't have a simple thing like a dashboard of build to build or deploy to deploy, what are your key events and which ones have significant changes over those. So things like that is another way to have uh, governance. But first step audit. And the second one is like, if you don't have it automated, if you don't have monitoring over it, uh, so you have to have a set of like, what are my golden events? What are the ones that can't break? And there should be a test for every single one of those. If there's ever a deploy and your delta of those goes above a certain uh, amount, you gotta fire an alert. Uh, if it's not automated, if you're relying on people to notice it, you're not gonna catch it and you're gonna miss those bugs. Any other questions? I have another one around um organization more than anything else. So it's kind of related to governance. There are various ways in which you can organize data on Google Cloud between projects and folders. And I'm wondering like, how do you organize your data? Uh, do you split storage versus query or not? Or what are like some of the things you do? Uh, badly, uh, to go back to my, what I would tell myself. Uh, so we did two things. We had we versioned our events. So first thing when we started at Reddit, there was no schemaless events, which is horrible. Uh, you always want a schema. You always want to enforce it. You want to be able to know what uh, fields are expected, what's not expected. Uh, so we had the view one events, and for those we actually broke them out by data set, and we had one project for all the events, uh, different projects. Uh, I shouldn't. Say, I don't know if it's a pro what is the so data sets are grouped by is it projects in BigQuery? No. Project data set table. Okay. So. Projects, I guess, is the, the thing that I was thinking of. Um, maybe I'm thinking of tables. Now I'm confused. Project is a Google Cloud project, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So ignore what I was saying. Uh, we have one, uh, multiple tables is what I wanted to have, not multiple data sets. Uh, I have one data set and one table for all my V2 events, and then I can't actually segment them uh, any more granular than a day's worth of data. Um, so we organize by, we have one project for uh, all of our production events. We have one project for uh, employee uh, data sets, so things that are like ad hoc analytics, uh, and those are literally organized by the employee name, so we know exactly who to go to and see like if they're just trying out different things or trying out different data sets, and they're not polluting the, the official project. Um, and then we have now the idea of like these reporting tables and aggregate tables, which were eventually forming into our golden data sets. So uh, what are the blessed tables and reports that we, that we have cleaned up data on, that we've got them pre-aggregated so that we can do queries really fast uh, on the business side? Um, so we definitely started down this a path on uh, Google Cloud Storage where we were trying to not have too many buckets and realize that was the wrong decision, that it's better to have more buckets because they are a pretty singular unit of control over whether it's lifecycle management or permissions or uh, the storage class. Buckets are, tend to be the way that GCS has you control them. So we've started moving more towards more buckets with fewer folders within them. Um, as far as BigQuery goes, we do have uh, particular blessed data sets where they have what we consider analytics data, which is kind of the nicely sanitized, cleaned, pre-joined data, which anyone who has kind of more cursory or casual questions about 
key metrics of the company can query those tables and trust that the analytics teams have made, done their job to make sure it's sane data and clean in there. Uh, I guess another benefit when you have multiple uh, projects or buckets, which is cost control, array. Right? So, uh, you know, you can structure your projects into different tiers and different tiers can have different uh, uh, capability run uh, queries. Uh, so you can set up caps on different bucket as well. So that's another way of doing good cost control in BigQuery. Uh, I have two questions, action item related. Uh, one is, uh, what should I tell my product managers? What change would you like from Google Cloud? Uh, <laughs> excellent. And the other question is, if you had to give, if someone here wants a weekend project, what would you recommend them to do? Like, what would be a fun project for the audience? Uh, custom partitions, uh, hierarchical partitions in BigQuery. Like, that would save my life. Uh, and weekend projects. Uh, I would say if you're looking for extra projects, Reddit is hiring. So you should just talk to me and I'll pay you to do your weekend projects. <laughs> Uh, if you don't want to get paid for the work, uh, I, I, I literally think, I mean, I know that it's more the data engineering, but I think anything like ML is, is huge. It's going to be even bigger. Uh, and if you want to be a data engineer in the future, likelihood is going to be a data engineer for ML projects. So I would pick whatever thing you are manually doing today, some repetitive process, some like classification thing, and go play and figure out if you can actually cre create some stupid dumb models to be able to uh, predict something for you there. Uh, the the really, really uh, there is one really really nice feature about uh, BigQuery I really like, which is your hyperlog plus uh, plus. I'm not sure if you guys all know what hyperlog log does. It's basically a uh, uh, algorithm that developed developed in 1980. Sorry, 1989. It's sort of. Uh, seven years younger than my age, but all right. So but basically what it does is trying to uh, at doing estimation of um, uh, distinct values over your data sets. And Google take it up to another level, which is that you publish a white paper about hyperlog log plus plus, which, you know, uh, typically if you see the original algorithm, it gave you the accuracy about 0.5%, which means if you actually count the distinct values, and also using the hyperlog log algorithm to count the distinct values, the, the, the difference should be around 0.5%. But in Google's case, it's about 0.05%. It's really impressive how accurate it is. And also, Google has a really nice feature, which you can, starting to uh, partition your uh, distinct values into uh, synopsis or sketches, which means, let's say, if I previously, if you want to count last seven days of distinct users, what you need to do is you always need to get all the users for the last seven days and starting to count distincts of them, right? But now, if you, in Google BigQuery, what you can do is for each day, you can count the distinct values and and put them into a uh, hashed string and store it for that day. Do it for the next six days, and when you want to look back for the last seven days of distinct, you just need to merge all of the last seven days together, which saves you a lot of computational power. Right, so that's one of the nicest features I really like in Good BigQuery. Uh, is it, other MPP has the same feature, but Google, in terms of the speed and accuracy, is the most the best I've ever seen. Not so much features, but since you're offering some PMs ears, um, being a little bit more public about when there are new changes or releases to BigQuery would be nice. We've had breaking changes where there was incompatibil incompatibilities between Dataproc and BigQuery, and we would file support tickets and not hear back about them. So that was a little discouraging. Um, and also have noticed uh, particular service outages of up to 20, 30 minutes that never show up on the status dashboard, which is a little frustrating when you're on PagerDuty and it's, there's an outage that you're observing and there's no word. So, sorry. Wait, they, they didn't have requests, so I'm going to throw in two more. Native sampling would be awesome. 
uh, we literally have an ETL that, automat that creates data sets that are sample just so we can query them. Uh, data sampling would be amazing. Uh, and now, this is coming from Reddit, so you have to feel this one. Like, make your UI not look ugly. Like, <laughs> and knowing that Reddit looks really ugly, like, that's bad. So can I add a few things? So uh, no, it's uh, no. Uh, I mean, when we when we move to BigQuery, I think the reliability is actually one of the reasons we move over to BigQuery. Uh, we had we run cluster in Metal Blaze in our own data center on AWS on Vertica in Redshift. The reliability we seen on those clusters and nowhere compares to BigQuery. So I think the reliability in Google Cloud is actually. Very, very good. Uh, the only thing that confused me is the name of different products Google have, like data proc, data pipe, data lab, data, st data studio. It actually confused me sometimes which tool to use and what tools is for what. Don't use AWS. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, we'll, we'll stop here. Um, thanks. Thanks to everyone for sharing your experience, sharing your thoughts about how things can be improved and what things they're working for. Thank you for, for attending the event. Um, so we have half an hour left in which we can just socialize, have a drink, uh, continue the conversations. Um, and that's it. Um, who gets the hat? Who gets the hat? So we have one question, one great question. He gets the hat. <laughs> Thank you very much and hope to see you at the next event. Thank you.